that's who I am, Alan Fennick. I'm from uh, the Faculty of Medicine Department for Infectious Disease Epidemiology at Imperial College. But that's only a, a blind, because what I really do is run the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, SCI, which, as you probably all know, is a highly recommended charity by Give Well, Giving What We Can, and The Life You Can Save. Um, so that's why I'm here, I guess. And what I'm basically going to tell you is what we do in terms of uh, controlling schistosomiasis and intestinal worms. And uh, I'm going to tell you how cost-effective we are and how super we are, because I'm a very modest person. <laughs> so first of all, I'm going to tell you what schistosomiasis is. Does anybody know what schistosomiasis is? Hands up. Great. I love talking to people who haven't got a clue what I'm talking Kind of. Okay. So uh, it's also known as Bilharzia. And it's caused by trematode worms. You can see the worms there. Uh, the big fat one, strong one, is the male, and the pathetic thin one is the female. Uh, totally not reflected by humans. And they are trematode worms. Now, all trematode worms actually infect snails. And there are hundreds of them. They all infect different snails, but then they have different hosts. And in the, uh, in the case of uh, schistosomiasis, it's a disease of the rural poor, and it's described as actually a disease of snails, which is transmitted by small boys. Because small boys, or other people, children swimming, farmers, and uh, ladies doing domestic washing in, uh, in lakes and ponds and canals in Africa, get infected from the larvae which leave the snail, and then they carry it and the worm lays eggs, and when the uh, infected individuals urinate or defecate in water, they then transmit the infection to other snails. So if any of you were infected with schistosomiasis, no matter how intimate you were with the person next, you couldn't infect them. It has to go through a snail. And there are uh, five species which, are, uh, which infect humans. Um, Schistosoma hematobium is a urinary infection because the adult worms live in the blood vessels around the bladder. And so when the worm lays eggs, the eggs burst through capillary tubes around the bladder, they get into the urine, and then when people urinate, out go the eggs. And of course, in escaping from the blood vessels, uh, the eggs also take blood with them, and so one of the main symptoms of having schistosoma. Now schistosoma mansoni looks exactly, the adult worm looks exactly the same, and uh, the life cycle is exactly the same, except that the adult worms, for some unknown reason, choose to uh, rest up, this looks like we've got another group here, maybe not, um, rest up uh, in the blood vessels around the intestine. So the eggs from schistosoma mansoni don't come out in the urine, they come out in the feces. Schistosoma hematobium is only found in Africa. Schistosoma mansoni is much more widespread. It would originated in Africa, but it was carried with the slave trade in the 19th century over to Brazil, and it just so happened that the correct snails were there in Brazil. Schistosoma japonicum, as the name might suggest, is um, limited to the Far East. It's actually been eradicated from China now. Uh, it was very, very widespread in China. Uh, sorry, eradicated from Japan. Very widespread in China, um, but it's uh, very restricted now, and there's less than a million people, which, of course, is a drop in the ocean of the Chinese. And then there are two smaller uh, species as well, uh, which are also found in Africa. And there's the life cycle that I've described. The adult worms in the human being, the eggs that are, are laid and escape, they have to infect a correct snail species. And if they do, they take over the body of the snail. And about a month later, a new larva will emerge, which is free swimming. Come on, come in. We charge you extra for coming, then. <laughs> and you don't get a seat either. <laughs> So 
Now I'm just going through the life cycle of the Wahazia or schistosomiasis and, and there it is. So you come in at a very good time. So the adult worms live in the human uh, body in, in the blood vessels, lay eggs which have to escape for the life cycle to continue. If they do escape in the urine or feces and reach fresh water, the eggs hatch and infect a snail. They take over the snail's body and a month later the snail starts emitting uh, these uh, the leaking through unbroken human skin of anybody who is in fresh water and then a month later having traversed around the body the adult worms uh, come meet uh, male and female meet up in the liver and then they go to their resting place where they live happily in uh, everlasting copulation for between 10 and 20 years and uh, the female lay lays about 300 eggs a day both blood in the urine and blood in the stool, but sadly for the human beings who are infected, only about half the eggs actually get out of the human body. So what happens to the others? Well, in the case of Schistosoma mansoni, the eggs get washed through the bloodstream to the liver. And once they get to the liver, they have nowhere to go. It's like a filter. And so they, uh, they're trapped there, they die, and once they die, the human body actually recognizes them and then causes a scar. So over a period of years, the liver gets totally fibrotic and uh, is no longer able to function. And people who've been infected at the age of 8, 9, and 10 will turn amygdalae. In the case of the urinary uh, infection, it can cause um, fibrosis of the bladder and bladder cancer. So there we are. Uh, where is it? Well, it's a tropical disease. And the reason it's a tropical disease is that the temperature of the water has to be between 24 and 30 degrees for the snails to survive and for the, uh, for the parasite to actually multiply uh, inside the snail. It's chronic, it's debilitating, and because it's totally dependent on human beings going into fresh water, it affects the poorest of the poor, mostly. Because those of you who are Scottish will be avid readers of the Daily Record, which is somewhere south of the sun. Um, and, and, and some years ago, when, uh, when Prince William was at uh, St Andrews University, he and a lady called Kate went to Uganda, and they went swimming in fresh water, which was a bit of a silly thing to do. And Prince William, as you can see there, was hit by a rare, told his mother, his grandmother and his grandfather, <laughs> you better go and get treated. Because, in actual fact, um, that's what happened. And he got treated very quickly, uh, and he got better. It's very much a man-made disease. The, the sort of disease and the, the whole life cycle developed in the days of, uh, of ancient Egypt, when you had the, uh, the Nile, which flooded once a year. You had very low populations the chances of that life cycle being completed were very rare. And so the, the chances of uh, people getting infected now is much greater because of our, um, the changes we've made to the environment. So the Blue Nile Dam in the 1920s in the Sudan caused a massive outbreak of schistosomiasis because we created conditions where snails could proliferate. On the, uh, the Volta and the Senegal rivers, there was a huge epidemic of schistosomiasis in Ghana and in Senegal. And of course, the Aswan High Dam changed the Egyptian Nile Delta forever. And whereas they used to have uh, one crop and then the water would flood and uh, wash everything away, <coughs> with the result of that dam, they now have two or three crops every year, but the water doesn't dry out and the snails aren't washed away. And so infection uh, can multiply. So this is a picture I took in Niger. Uh, three poor little children, and 80% of the children in that school had urine like that. It really is a very prevalent disease. And in uh, Uganda, as a result of Schistosoma mansoni, uh, this poor uh, child or young man did not live for very much longer because his liver uh, was completely shot. However, an awful lot of people don't seem to have symptoms because the symptoms depend on how many worms you've got inside you. If you've got a lot of worms, your liver is going to get blocked that much quicker. If you've only got a few worms, people often don't even know they're infected. And yet, there is no such thing 
as asymptomatic schistosomiasis, even though it may appear so, because underneath the surface, there's pain, diarrhea, malnutrition, anemia, obviously, all associated with these infections. But of course, it's very difficult to actually put your finger on it and say it's due to schistosomiasis, because exactly those same things will uh, be caused by other worm infections, and uh, if the people are lucky enough to be able to drink a bottle of whiskey a day, they would suffer probably from uh, exactly the same symptoms. One other thing which is much more recently been realized is that actually schistosomiasis is a huge problem for young girls, particularly in areas where schistosoma hematobium uh, is very heavily uh, infecting people because the, some of the eggs actually get into the female genital system and if they get into the uh, cervix, they can, they can cause lesions. And these lesions are then linked to an increased risk of HIV. Because sadly in those areas, uh, many young girls, when they do start to be sexually active, they tend to uh, be sexually active with older men who may well be infected with HIV. And then because of these lesions, the door is open, so to speak, for the HIV infection to go in. And data from Mozambique, Malawi, South Africa, and Tanzania indicates that the prevalence of HIV in teenage girls is much, much higher than would be expected by normal uh, behavior. So it's really essential that we take an active and proactive step to actually treat these young girls against schistosomiasis before they start showing any symptoms, before they have any lesions. The other thing that's recently been realized is that priest, we always thought that it was school-aged children, aged maybe 6 to 12, who were most likely to get very heavily infected. But in fact, uh, people who've been observing uh, the very heavily infected areas are in Lake Malawi, for instance, and in uh, Lake Albert and, and Lake Victoria, have, have seen women taking their children down to the lake shore when they're washing their clothes. And they... Uh, they put them in a, in, a, in a little bucket and fill it full of water. And of course, the water's got these uh, schistosomiasis larvae inside them. And so we're finding uh, that younger children are getting infected, very young children. And then when we come to treat them, it's very difficult because uh, the tablets that we actually uh, use, and they're not tables, I can see them, it's like spelling mistake there, the tablets are very bitter, so uh, uh, the children find them very difficult to swallow, and if they chew them, they tend to uh, spit them out. So we're trying to find a pediatric formulation of the drug that we use. And this is uh, just a, a nice photograph to show why everybody is infected. This is in Mali, where there was a huge lake, and towards the end of the, uh, uh, of the rainy season, the, the, uh, the lake starts contracting, and it's full of fish, and everybody goes in and collects fish and bilharzia. So how do we diagnose it and how do we treat it? Well, uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, the eggs are coming out in the urine and the stool, and so microscopic examination does actually uh, throw up these eggs. Only it's not a very, uh, not a very uh, friendly way of, uh, of diagnosing because uh, uh, stool in particular is rather unpleasant to work with uh, and urine too. But recently we've come up with um, a dipstick and uh, urine examination can actually indicate schistosomiasis by putting just a, a dipstick which will detect blood in the urine because uh, blood in the urine is almost uh, diagnostic of schistosomiasis. Of course in heavy, very heavy infections you can see the blood in the urine. And then we also have now a CCA test uh, which is again a urine dipstick but uh, strangely, it actually uh, diagnoses schistosoma mansoni rather than hematobium, but that turns out to be very useful and actually very sensitive. And then we use an ultrasound to actually have a look and see uh, what people's liver and uh, bladder looks like. So we do an awful lot of testing. Um, in order to reach out and get to the young children, we, we go into a school and we will take maybe 30 samples from school children and we'll diagnose them, and if we find more than three infected, we actually just treat everybody, not only in that school, but in all the schools in the area. And the reason we do that is because diagnosis is expensive, and the drugs are very cheap. And treating school children is dead easy, as you can imagine. The school children tend to uh, do as they're told, uh, 
and uh, we can line them up and give them a pill and they'll just swallow it. And it only has to be done once a year. Of course, there are a few constraints. Uh, I took this photograph in Liberia when unfortunately the drugs didn't arrive in time for the dry season and we tried to get them to the schools in the wet season. And that's our uh, vehicle there trying to get through. Uh, uh, in fact, we waited till the dry season before we treated them. But we do a lot of data collection as well. One thing is uh, when people donate to us uh, either money or drugs, they want to know that uh, their, their, um, their donations have been used. The, uh, the, we take heights and weights, we uh, palpate the livers, we do stool and urine examinations um, so that we can uh, determine how many people are infected both before and then, what's more important, after, after treatment. And this is the uh, ultrasound, uh, ultrasound work that we do. So how can we control it? Well, if we go back to the life cycle, if you can break that life cycle in any way, then you will get no new infections. The only way you can treat people, the only way you can make people better is to actually treat them. And where you've got very high uh, percentages of people infected, obviously chemotherapy with the drug praziquantel is, is, is what we need. But eventually, when we, if we're headed uh, towards when we've treated everybody, improved sanitation is going to stop infection because it will stop the uh, defecation and the urination in, uh, in water and therefore the snails won't get infected. We could try and kill the snails. And in fact, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, everybody thought the snail was a weak link and that was the way to control schistosomiasis. But the snail was far too clever. And uh, what you had to use was a, a very unfriendly chemical in a large body of water. And it turned out to be A, too expensive, and B, we weren't killing enough snails. And then, of course, you can prevent exposure, which is all very well if you've got a water supply, if you've got a shower, if you've got a bath. But when children are coming out of school at uh, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the afternoon and the temperature is between 90 and 110 degrees Fahrenheit and there's a nice pond and stream there, it's very unlikely that you're going to stop people actually getting exposed. So just how much uh, control has there been? Believe it or not, in the year 2002, there were 200 million people infected with schistosomiasis in sub-Saharan Africa and not a single country had a control program. There was absolutely no control going on. And that was because in the year 2002, HIV, malaria and TB were seen as neglected tropical diseases. These other diseases weren't even on the radar at that time. There were two or three uh, very big programs to control, uh, but they were not in what I would call developing countries. They were in China, the Philippines and Brazil, and in Egypt. And uh, in North Africa, which really is outside of the most endemic areas, um, schistosomiasis was being controlled in Saudi Arabia and, uh, and in Morocco. So, as I said, what we've got to do is be proactive. So how do we proactive? Where do we start? And we start by mapping. So these are just a, a, a couple of maps of uh, Uganda and Burundi and Tanzania. And the areas uh, in red are where there is more than 50% of school children infected. On the left is hookworm, which I'm going to uh, explain a bit about in a minute. And on the right is schistosomiasis. As you can see, the, uh, the prevalence of schistosomiasis is much more patchy, and the reason for that is the temperature, that many parts of those countries are quite high, and when they're high, the snails do not uh, support the uh, parasite. But nevertheless, there are still many areas where over 50% of the population in schools are infected. So the World Health Organization in the year uh, 2001 decided that they would set up a target. We had, a, we had a drug, uh, praziquantel, and uh, we had uh, another drug, albendazole, which, uh, which can be given in conjunction. The praziquantel will get rid of the schistosomiasis, and the albendazole will deworm children. And the plan was that by 2010, 
um, at least 75% of all school-age children would be treated. Of course, the World Health Organization is famous for not hitting its targets, and very few people, very few countries, had actually got that far by 2010. In fact, only eight in things got moving. <coughs> so, what are these other ones? Uh, the soil-transmitted helmets, they're called, and there are uh, three major ones. Ascariasis, which is a roundworm, Trichuriasis, uh, which is a whipworm, and hookworm, uh, who has got two names, but they're both a bit complicated. In fact, one of the main reasons I talk about neglected tropical diseases, I'm the only person uh, who can actually spell them and pronounce them, because uh, there's some other, other nice tropical diseases as well that roll off the tongue. Uh, Trypnosomiasis, Leishmaniasis, Trypunculiasis, Onchocerciasis, to the name but a few. Anyway, back to the uh, limited lecture. So this little girl has a bit, of a, a bit of a tummy. It's not like me, she hasn't eaten too much. She's actually not eaten enough, and she has roundworms inside her. As you can see, a lot of people have these worms, and in fact, one in six of the population uh, of the whole uh, of, of the world live on under $2 a day. And it's because they're poor that they're infected with these parasites, and it's because they've got these parasites that they're poor. Anyway, we found that we could treat these uh, uh, worms, and it was only found in about 1980, 1990, with albendazole. Albendazole is a very cheap, cheap drug. I was buying it for one penny. And this is, these, these are the worms that this little child uh, produced. And as you can imagine, once she'd uh, emitted those worms, uh, she felt an awful lot better. And in fact, this is a photo, a before and after photograph, uh, just to show how effective treatment is if you can get that treatment to people uh, before, they, uh, bef before they get too heavily infected for too long. And uh, this was uh, before and after treatment with this one pill of albendazole, which, as I say, we were buying for a penny from a generic uh, producer in, uh, in India. As for, for schistosomiasis, we have one drug. It was discovered in about 1980. Prior to that, we didn't have an effective drug. And uh, when it first came to the market, it, uh, it cost a dollar a, a tablet. And the uh, company that uh, manufactured it, Bayer, probably were rubbing their hands together, doing their mathematics, thinking, well, 200 million people infected. We probably got to treat them every year. And uh, at a dollar a tablet, we could be making an awful lot of money. The only problem is that people who've got schistosomiasis don't have, to have two pennies to rub together, so they couldn't afford to buy them. And they weren't high enough on the priority list of the uh, ministries of health in these very poor countries, so basically they weren't selling it. And then in the, uh, it, around 1995, a South Korean company uh, decided that they would uh, manufacture uh, praziquantel much more cheaply. It, uh, it's now off patent. And so the price went down and down and down. And in 2006, when the SCI was uh, buying Praziquantel, um, we were actually paying only 8 cents a tablet, which is 92% reduction in price is not bad. If any of you got schistosomiasis and you went to a pharmacy in London or Exeter, probably wouldn't have any in Exeter, I don't suppose, but if you went to a pharmacy in London and asked for four tablets of uh, Praziquantel, as somebody did, uh, we had a Tanzanian patient who came in and uh, he, he went to the pharmacy and they tried to charge him £60 for four tablets. So it just shows you the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmacists are not, uh, not all uh, good. However, you all know that the pharmaceutical industry are heavily into making profits. They're totally unscrupulous and they screw us all. But for those people who are trying to treat neglected tropical diseases, they're actually the good guys. Merck, which is a German company, in 2007 were persuaded to donate some Praziquanta. And they said they would donate 20 million tablets a year. But that's only enough to treat 8 million children, which is not only a scratching the surface when you've got 200 million infected in the whole of Africa. But even more pressure was put on them by the generosity of the other pharmaceutical companies so that in, uh, in 2010, they said that they would increase their production and their donation. And so they've done. 
And this year, 2015, they're going to donate 105 million tablets. And from next year, annually, 250 million tablets every year, which is enough to treat 100 million school children. For the intestinal worms, GlaxoSmithKline, who have already been donating albendazole for lymphatic filariasis, which time doesn't allow me to uh, tell you much about today, but in 2010, uh, they committed to building a factory in South Africa and another one in India. And they now produce a billion tablets of albendazole, which they donate free of charge every year. And 600 million go to treating lymphatic filariasis, and 400 million are available to us for deworming school-age children. And Johnson & Johnson, not to be outdone, having been donating 50 million tablets of mubendazole, which is another deworming tablet, increased their donation to 200 million tablets a year. So we actually have in our hands 600 million tablets of deworming pills, and we have enough praziquantel to treat 100 million children. What's probably not known, and I've yet to lecture to a group of people where more than three or four have known, is that every year for the last three years, every year, 700 million people worldwide have received one or more of these drugs free of charge. And so treatment is really uh, a great success story and it's going ahead very quickly. With praziquantel, you're supposed to give it by weight and uh, it's 15 milligram per kilogram. But unfortunately, we found that weighing machines don't work very well. Looking around, most of you don't seem to be quite as weight conscious as I am. But uh, if you were, you would know that if you weighed yourself every morning after shaving to, you know, cut down the weight as much as possible, if you lean forward, you can, operate, you can be three kilograms lighter than if you lean backwards. So, and that's on a concrete floor. But you put these, uh, these scales on sandy floors and, and they're just hopeless. You would never get the dose right. So what we've done is we've, we've taken the normal, obviously small fat children need a few more tablets and tall skinny ones perhaps a little less, but we actually have a dose pole and we line the kids up against this pole and instead of saying you're two meters high, we say you're two and a half tablets high and then the man at the next table gives them two and a half tablets and bingo there. They're treated, and it only has to be done once a year, it's so easy. So how many people do we need to treat? Well, these are the top 10 or 12 countries, and uh, the World Health Organization <coughs> estimates that there are 60 million people in Nigeria alone who need treating for schistosomiasis, and as you can see, the numbers run all the way down to poor old Sudan, uh, who only need 5.8 million people treating. When we do mapping, we find that those numbers are not quite as accurate, but nevertheless, throughout Africa, there are 200 million people who are actually infected today with this parasite. So SCI started in 2003 with, um, with money from uh, our good benefactor, Bill Gates, who I guess some of you will have heard of. And uh, he started his foundation in, uh, in 1999, and he gave money for distributing uh, vaccines first. Uh, measles and MMR vaccines into Africa and so I was lucky enough to go and see him and uh, told him that there were a lot more diseases. He was also um, looking for uh, a malaria vaccine and mentioned schistosomiasis so uh, he said to me well um, what do you need? So I said well um, we, need, we, need, we have a drug and all we need to do is buy the drug and deliver it into the countries. So he said, well, that sounds great. Go, go for it. Um, so I said, well, there's just one thing. I haven't actually told any of the countries yet. Uh, I've just come to you with the idea. So he said, well, I'll tell you what. Write me a letter, and uh, I'll give you some money, and you can go around the countries and pick the ones that you think are the best. So I wrote him a letter. Dear Mr. Gates, will you give me some money to travel around Africa and uh, look into the possibility of treating schistosomiasis? And he wrote back and said, Yes, indeed, here's a cheque for $750,000, off you go. So off I went, and I travelled around and went to ministries of health and this, that, and the other. And uh, he gave me, it was a one-year grant. So after six months, I was getting there, uh, I got this phone call from the Gates Foundation. They said, well, where's your, where's your plan? 
So I said, well, then, a year, you get me a year. And they said, ah, but we've got a budget meeting tomorrow, and we want to know how much you need to control schistosomiasis. So I had to think very quickly. Um, so I said, $50 million, please. And uh, so they said, OK. And a week later, they phoned me up and they said, look, sorry, we've got some really bad news. Um, we, we had our budget meeting, and uh, nobody knows what schistosomiasis is, so we can't give you $50 million. So I was a bit deflated until he said, can you make do with 34 million? So that's why SCI was started, and we had enough money to actually treat in six countries, uh, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia, and then another donor came in and gave us money for Burundi and Rwanda. So for a period of seven years, we started uh, proving the principle, if you like, that uh, treatment would work, it would benefit people, and if the, if the countries were given the wherewithal, they were quite happy to allocate local staff uh, to deliver the drugs. And basically, this is what we had to do, because we had to satisfy the donor that we had, uh, we'd used the money. So we, we had to have a, a national plan the, uh, with the government so that things could go forward and uh, find out what, uh, what personnel they had available. It was amazing, almost every country had somebody who was an expert on schistosomiasis. What they'd done was, um, people in various places like uh, the London School of Tropical Medicine, the Liverpool School, um, and, and even in, in Europe, would offer to countries training. So people would be sent for training, and they'd be trained on all these various uh, parasitic diseases. They'd go back to the countries, and then they, they didn't have any money to do anything. And I can remember going, uh, knocking on the door where it said schistosomiasis control uh, in, in the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. And I opened the door, and there's a very nice person who I actually met at uh, various conferences, sat behind the desk, and the desk was totally empty. And uh, in the top drawer on the right-hand side, he had his sandwiches, and in the top drawer on the left-hand side, he had a newspaper. And he sat there day in, day out, because he had nothing to do. He didn't have the wherewithal to actually do any control, and that was what we were able to offer. We were able to offer uh, the health education material, we were able to offer the drugs, and uh, we were able to offer training, and so we did a pilot study, uh, and uh, slowly but surely uh, increased our coverage in each of those countries with the money that the Gates had given us. Then in 2010, we managed to get extra funding from the British government, and that enabled us to uh, increase to cover Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia, uh, Malawi and Mozambique. And then the next step uh, is very, very recent, where we've had additional money as a result of the recommendations from Give Well and Giving What We Can. We've had money from the World Bank for Yemen, and we've had money from uh, a couple of other uh, um, high donors, uh, high net worth donors, so that we can start work in Ethiopia, DRC. Uh, we hope to go into Zimbabwe, we haven't yet, uh, into Madagascar, uh, and into Sudan, Mauritania, and Senegal. As you can see, that's a much better looking map uh, than just the, uh, the red areas, but there are still a, a number of countries to go. Some of those countries are actually covered because um, the, the I'll, I'll skip that one. I'm going for time. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the the big the big thing the the success story is actually getting the drugs out to the people and getting them to be persuaded to take them. It's not done by white men. It's done by the people that we've trained within the uh, within the ministries of health. And the way to do it is to launch the program, and you've got to buy people a T-shirt and a hat. So all these people wearing hats are ministers in the Ugandan government, and they all came out when we launched, and this poor little girl was chosen as the, the guinea pig, if you like, the first person to be treated, and that's the uh, deputy prime minister who is giving her uh, the full dose of praziquantel. And I was whispering in, in her ear, don't bite the tablet, swallow it, because of course if she bit into it, she'd probably have vomited all over it. Uh, but we uh, touch wood that things go well, and, it, and in fact they did. So we've had a few success stories. So for instance, in Egypt, over a period of 10 years, the prevalence and intensity of these diseases have gone right down. And in fact, in, um, in 1970, uh, 
Bladder cancer caused by schistosomiasis was the most common cancer in Egypt. And today you won't find it at all because uh, over a period of 20 years, schistosomiasis has virtually disappeared. And that what we've, able to, uh, we've been able to show the donors is that with two or three um, sets of treatment, that the prevalence and intensity of, of these infections, both hookworm and schistosomiasis, are, are definitely reduced. Blood in the urine in Burkina Faso disappears after just one round of treatment. And after a period of time, it's much more slowly, uh, hemoglobin counts will go up uh, as blood loss is reduced. But it's still neglected. It's still not a priority. And we couldn't get people other than Mr. Gates to donate money to us. So how did we do that? What could we do? And we used the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. Because as you've seen, we're never going to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger if every child in the uh, developing world is, is full of worms. Because what little food they've got gets eaten by the worms before they can benefit from it. We're never going to achieve universal primary education if these kids are infected, because if they are strong enough to walk to school, they probably fall asleep when they're there and they're not going to learn. We're not going to reduce child mortality or improve maternal health because women of childbearing age have got these infections and they cause anemia. And anemia is the biggest cause of a poor birth outcome and maternal mortality. The Millennium Development Goals weren't exactly kind to these neglected tropical diseases. Number six said combine, uh, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And of course, we had lumped in there with, with the other diseases. So that wasn't a particularly great argument. But for four of the eight Millennium Development Goals, we could actually point our finger and say, unless you uh, implement control against these diseases, you're never going to be successful. The Millennium Development Goals actually finished this year, and of course there's still an awful long way to go. But they're going to have uh, sustainable development goals which are going to start, and uh, after a lot of lobbying, I have to say that neglected tropical diseases are going to be in these new, uh, these new development goals. But the big thing, and one of the reasons I'm here, is to explain to you and show you just how cost-effective and how well leveraged donations are. Because look at these uh, costs. If you're going to uh, keep someone free of HIV AIDS, you're going to need something between $60 and $150 every year to treat people for HIV AIDS. TB, again, very much similar. The average family in Africa spends $35 a year on treating uh, malaria. And we can treat these diseases for less than 50 pence per person per year because we um, deliver through schools, we deliver through communities, and we have the leverage that the drugs are delivered, uh, are delivered to us free. The value of the drugs that we give out to these 700 million people every year is in the billions of dollars. And yet we only need 50, 50 pence per, per person per year to deliver them. The situation has changed. For 10 years now, we have been buying Praziquantel, and we bought enough that we had the funding to deliver. And so the bottleneck was the amount of Praziquantel we had. But thanks to this donation from Merck, we've now reached this situation. That last year, we had enough tablets purchased by the American government, the British government, and uh, an NGO, and the donation from Merck to treat 110 million individuals. Those drugs are now in the countries and will be used in 2015 to treat something like 110 million people. And the same is true this year. The uh, drugs are being manufactured and they'll be delivered. But next year, we'll be up to half as much again almost. We'll have enough drug from the various sources to treat 150 million people. The USAID are going to reduce the number of drugs they actually buy, and they're going to put that money into delivery. But basically, we have never yet, um, in 2013, 2014, using 
the donation, remember the donation's a year behind. We've never treated more than 50 million individuals. And yet in two years' time, we're going to have enough drug to treat 150 million individuals, and we just don't have the money to actually deliver it. Only two countries donate money for implementation because they see it as using drugs, um, they don't see it, it, it's not research, and they don't see it as value for money, except for the United States and for the UK. As you know, the British government's got more money than it knows what to do with, and so they very generously gave 50 million over five years, which is, again, very, very little in 2008. But thanks to uh, a lot of advocacy, particularly by Bill Gates, actually, um, they've increased their, uh, their donation to 200 million over, over the next four years in order to uh, um, get these treatments out. There are a few other donors, uh, not very many. Uh, the End Fund, which uh, is an American-based organization that goes around high net worth individuals and persuades them to give money. Uh, people like basketball players who maybe have come from, you know, they're six foot ten and they've come from the southern Sudan and they've made a fortune in America. And so these guys go and say, well, you know, why don't you give us some money to go back to your country? And that's been quite successful. I'm not sure how much Didier Drogba has given, but uh, he's probably given some. And the uh, footballers from, uh, from, from Africa are um, people that we can approach. The World Bank uh, really should give a lot more. Uh, but actually only supports uh, Shisto control in one country, which is the Yemen. And then these two uh, recommended sites, which uh, have realized the good value of both uh, malaria control and, um, and parasite control. And so they recommend Against Malaria Foundation and uh, SCI as the, uh, as the two best charities that are worth supporting globally. So our treatment plans, the, what, the uh, color in, in yellow is, is what we've actually got money for, guaranteed for the next uh, three years. Uh, we've got enough money to treat between 30 and 50 million individuals. And this year we're, we're going to treat 40 million. But for every million pounds that we can raise, we can guarantee to treat at least two more million. And by 2019, we won't have any money at all. All our promised grants have, have run out. But we're very hopeful that both DFID and the United States government will increase, and we're putting uh, a lot of advocacy pressure through the governments to uh, some of the European Union people to, to get them to uh, join us as well. But the World Health Organization believe that we should be able to uh, target these diseases, first of all for control, and then for elimination. So the current situation is that we're here. We're only treating about 20% of the individuals at the moment every year who need treating. But with the free drugs, over the next three or four years, those numbers should go rocketing up. But we'll never reach the finishing line, not without some extra, uh, extra input. And that extra input, as you could imagine, is going to be getting these people out of poverty. It's going to be giving them water supplies and giving them improved sanitation. And if we can do that, there's a very good chance that maybe in half the countries in Africa, schistosomiasis and the soil will be a public health problem. There will still be people who are infected, and we've got to keep treating them. But at least we won't get people with the uh, pot bellies, we won't get people with hepatosplenomegaly, and we won't get people with bladder cancer. And at least that will be half the job done. So this is a World Health Organization slide, and it's showing the trajectory in the white dotted line of the way things are going at the moment. I mean, it's incredible that in the last four years, between uh, 700 and 750 million people have received these free drugs. And as I say, I, I really, it, it's amazing to me that the pharmaceutical industry don't give a little bit more uh, credibility and a little bit more publicity to what they do. But if we're going to get to elimination, we've got to really ramp up 
particularly with schistosomiasis, which is the one, um, the, the, the one that is least uh, being, uh, being treated. So these figures at the bottom show the number of people who have been treated for lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, which is river blindness, and then the numbers for schistosomiasis, trachoma, and, um, and, and intestinal worms are a much lower percentage in the numbers of people infected. So there's a long way to go. First of all, for control, and second, to, really, uh, to reach elimination. Now, because you're all fascinated in global health, because you're here, I thought I'd just give a, a one slide with a, a, a little bit of an advertisement. Because I run in Imperial College every year a one-week global health course that deals a lot more than with just uh, um, in, uh, neglected tropical diseases. And uh, if anybody's interested, you can uh, Google Global Health Course Imperial College. It's the cheapest course in the whole world. Um, and because of that, it does tend to sell out quite quickly. Anyone who's interested in mathematical epidemiology, there's a three-week course every September at Imperial. And there's a, a one-year course for people who are already uh, at university, usually medical students, who take a year out to do a BSc. And there's a five-day short course on GIS uh, mapping uh, for public health, uh, which is held in July, uh, slightly 